Hit the road, gals. Travel back. We're going back to the 60s. Uh, joining Bridget Ashton and her friends, students, as they dare to divide convention and hitchhike their way through an era of change. It is a road trip that takes in Wales, Scotland, also France, the Atlas Mountains, Ireland, and even Spain. Did I say that? Joining us uh, live on the line from somewhere, I presume, in the UK, unless she's on the road again, is Bridget Ashton. Bridget, good morning to you. Hello. Good to, good to have you with us. Um, tell us a little bit about your adventures then. You, you, you literally hit the road. You traversed all over Europe, even behind the Iron Curtain, when this wasn't a thing that you know, young ladies were kind of doing. You're absolutely right. I mean, we were girls in an all-girls college, and we'd been in Hereford in England on the Welsh border, and we were being trained to be teachers. We were brought up to be very respectable, to contain ourselves until marriage, and then to be nice, well-behaved teachers. But that sort of idea didn't really suit us very well, and we learned to get out and about by getting out onto the roads and smiling charmingly as the traffic came along and gradually learned to work our way Hitting the road, and and this is this is a throwback to the sixties. This is also obviously a much more innocent time. Not as much traffic on the roads, I, I would imagine, as well. Especially, you yeah, know. you're you're quite right there. For one thing, there weren't any motorways, and so you could just get out. We used to buy sixpenny road maps from the petrol station and work out which road we had to get onto, walk out of town, and just stand at the roadside and hitchhike. And was there a sort of defined place you you, you wanted to go for, to, I don't know, York because you wanted to see the, the Minster or, or you, what, 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 was there a cultural aim or were you just going to go out and have a good time and see what you found? Well, a bit of everything really, <clears throat> but we certainly worked out how to do it. You always had to get to the edge of town and that meant either walking out if it was a smallish town on the A497 or whatever it was, um, but... Otherwise, you know, it was just quite easy to do. We, we learned how to go to London. We could go from Hereford to London in about four hours, cost us next to nothing. And then when we got there, of course, you've got to manipulate London, which mm. is quite a different kettle of fish. And so we learned to work the underground. I shouldn't really admit all this at this age, but we would get on and get on the train without a ticket and get off. And then once the, the inspector person said, well, did you come down in the lift on such and such a station? And we said, yes. And of course, there hadn't been a lift there. So we got towed off. So we were always, we never had much money. We were always trying to work out how to do things very, very cheaply. So that was sort of doing the, the, the UK, but then you set your sights further. And again, this is, this is a time when not a lot of people are going, going overseas. So yes, you, decided, right. you decided to hit France for a start, was it? Yes. Well, that's right. Well, to us, living in the west of England on the Welsh borders, France was just so exotic, so remote and so challenging. But we decided we would. In the end, it was just two of us. And we hitchhiked through London down to Dover. And then you could get on the, you could walk onto a ferry boat with a two pound ticket which is what we did. And we had to keep our two pounds carefully for our return ticket. Right. Got off in France and went down to the Massy Central. And you know, it was just so amazing. And the bread and the language, they really did speak French. You know, you couldn't sort of believe it. And, um, you know, oh. So there we were, the youth hostel in France, and we were soon befriended by two charming young Frenchmen. What, 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 what a surprise that is. I, I, I can't imagine that sort of thing happening. I mean, did you, did you find that people were sort of curious and welcoming? Yes, on the whole, I would say so. I mean, there was definitely a bit of a hitchhiking culture. It was the on-the-road um, Jack Kerouac-type era. Mm. And so young people were moving around, and you did frequently you know, meet people like ourselves. We would usually meet them in youth hostels, all different nationalities, travelling all around. And this is the thing, because you're, this is the 60s, and there is youth culture yeah. is really going strong. There's a change yeah. in the air. Did you feel part of that sort of new freedom uh, did you feel because i mean obviously probably. yeah probably i think we were on the cusp of that you know our, the, our families wanted us to be nice normal respectable girls marriage job and everything but the, it was the beatles it was the rolling stones that the music was different and i think we did you know unconsciously we just absorbed all that so was this what was it 60 64 65 no, the, yeah. Three years this book is about is between 63 and 66 which is when i was in the all girls college in hereford Okay. And you came to Spain, which must have been very interesting in the 60s, because obviously, yeah. you know, it, it, was, yeah. it, it wasn't a democracy at, at that point. So, and also, you know, compared with France, I mean, Spain must have been very interesting. 
Well, it was totally interesting. Now, you must excuse me, but we were so ignorant. We knew nothing about history or politics or anything. We just thought, we'll go to Spain, they dance flamenco, you know, it'll be fun. <laughs> right. And so four, five of us went to the Spanish border and crossed over. We didn't even know about Franco. We knew nothing. And there we were suddenly in this Spanish hot, dry country. And as we crossed over the mountains between France and Spain, between France and Spain, that's right, we kind of walked and hitchhiked over. There were all these beetles, these big, enormous jumping beetle things were jumping all over the road. You couldn't walk without trampling on these beetles. It was terrifying. So that was our first impression. But no, Spain was lovely. I mean, so exotic, so different. Yeah, but I mean, obviously at the time, I mean, young women on their own in Spain, I mean, it was a very macho culture, wasn't it? Definitely. And we did suffer from that. I mean, everywhere you went, there all the time, which means blonde girls. And, you know, we were unusual in our looks. And um, so certainly in the countryside area, people hadn't seen too many people like us. And we were in danger once or twice as well, actually, because of that. Because what, people sort of follow you? or they... Yes, well, we were dying to see all, you know, fiestas and the fun of Spain, and we did that. We were in a lorry, we were travelling down south towards Seville, and then we passed through a town where there was a big fiesta, and we thought, this is fun, you know, with fairground and lights and yeah. everyone around. So we got out, and the, um, a group of young boys were attracted to us immediately, it always happened. And at first we were happy just to let them take us on rides, and we were having fun together. But then when we decided it was time to go, they followed us and they were really, really pesky. And there was more of them than us. And it was quite a frightening situation. Yeah, because, again, this is the thing. I mean, it is, you know, group. I mean, at least there were a group of you traveling. So, um, yes, that's right. Well, there were three of us at that point. Yeah. And then, and then you went to one of my favorite places in the world, which is the Atlas Mountains. Now, that must have been an experience. <laughs> How did you get it? Did you, did you go, obviously, from Spain over, you know, via... No, no, okay. no, that was a totally different time. Um, Spain was summer 64, and summer 65, my friend and I decided we were going to go to the Sahara and ride on camels. Now, that was about some of our knowledge. Right. We had a few maps. We um, hitchhiked down through Italy to Naples, and then we crossed from Naples to Palermo by boat. And then we crossed from Palermo to Tunis, also by boat overnight. Wow. wow. And then we just got out. You know, there we were in this country with people wearing different costumes and Arabic language. And I mean, this is amazing. So we stayed in Tunis a day or two. We hitchhiked across Algeria. There had just been a civil war, which had ended a few years before that. And everybody warned us, but, you know, we went along. And then we got to Casablanca, Marrakesh. And from there, we headed south down to the Sahara, which is what we, our ultimate aim in doing was. And we did sort of manage to do that. And camels aside, apparently there were proposals of marriage uh, in Morocco, as there always are. (laughs) Well, yes. I mean... Just before that, we got as far as this little place called Mohammed, which was right on the northern edge of the Sahara, and that's where the camels camels were. Near near Erg Shigaga? Near near Algeria, the Algerian border, Mohammed Agizan? No, I don't think so. I think we didn't place. We went south from Marrakesh and Waza Zagora, and then down to Mohammed. Yes, yes. And there was like the remains of a French fort there, and there was a caliph there and he was the one with the camels well we had to do a lot of argy bargying before he would finally agree to let us go out on his camels which we did and it was so fabulous what did you think of the sahara because it, it is it is a mind-blowing experience isn't it we were just on the fringes of mm. the, the bit leading up to it was all sort of stony flat yeah. and there weren't roads there were just tracks and the tracks always changing according to the wind and whatever's happened but it, you know, just to be in the desert. And then these men were making mud bricks for their houses, stamping in the mud up and down, and we joined in with that. And we didn't know how we were going to get back because my friend Mary had to be back in um, her parents' family in Swindon by the 30th of August. This was about the 15th. <laughs> there we were, not knowing quite. From the Sahara that. to Swindon in one fell yeah. swoop. In two days, with, you know, just a few pounds. <laughs> but then this little white car came along and they gave us a lift. They were British. And they'd managed to get there, a man and a woman who were bird watching, and they'd carried their water in plastic tubs all the way from England because they didn't trust the water. So we had an English drink of water as well. They can't, yeah, don't, whatever you do, don't drink the water. And 
you and also... then you asked about the marriage. I'll just tell yeah. you that bit. Yeah. So we got to Zagora and we had a list from this man who was collecting and delivering pop bottles. And he was going from Zagora to Marrakesh overnight over the Atlas Mountains. Wonderful. So we clambered up on the top of all these crates of bottles and that was how we travelled over. And then we got to big stop in the middle of the atlas somewhere and you know they tried the usual thing and offering me money and and we spoke a little bit of french but very little as they did and eventually kept putting the money up and up until it got to about five pounds translated and i was still refusing and then uh, he said Je vous épouserai, madame. i will marry you <laughs> so i wish you remember that tell us a little bit about the trip over to, to, to ireland as well you yes yeah. well Again, you know, there we were in Hereford, and Ireland was as different as France or Spain. It was so completely different. I just went over, they hitchhiked over to Fish Garden, over to Ross Lane, and I, I got into a music festival, sort of bumped into it. And I just found the young Irish people so relaxed, and they would sing, and they were friendly, and we camped, and, and it was just different from sort of the English young people, very, very approachable, and musical i really loved it and then of course they're all catholics in those days anyway and they had to go to mass so even though we'd spent the most of the night carousing and you know having fun and drinking and singing we still had to go to mass in the morning so i mean that was really something we were falling asleep as we stood up and kneeled down and everything but i really loved ireland and eventually um, i made a group of friends there and they would come over to visit us in hereford from ireland and Eventually, one of my friends even married one of them. So that was wonderful. Absolutely brilliant. So presumably you did, you did graduate. You did pass your, you know, you did actually get your qualifications you were trying to get, uh, with, with, despite all this traveling, yeah? Well, yes. I mean, me and my particular friend Mary, some others, we were geography students and we excused all our travel. Oh, road trip. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) And we even managed to persuade our geography tutor, main tutor, to let us do our special end of year studies um, in France, which was fun because that's some of the places we've been to. So I went off to Brittany and studied Brittany and its culture and its geography. And my friend Mary did um, the same in the Massey Central. So that was, you know, really, we somehow struggled through our college course. I have to say that we did manage to pass. We did really nice special studies and we learned loads, different kind of education. So, do you still keep in touch with the the, the, the girls that you travelled with, or has it just... Well, yes. Yeah. With Mary, who um, married the Irish man, lives now in County Waterford in, in Ireland. As soon as our children, we both we married, we had children, they grew up, as soon as they were big enough to be left, we would go off again. We started all over again, and we've been all over France. We went to Kazakhstan, into the deserts, and up into the mountains of Kazakhstan, you know, we've had so many adventures. We've never really stopped. I mean, you wrote about Cold War Warm Hearts, which was the yeah. travels behind the Iron Curtain. Yeah. So this book must have seemed like a natural succession to, to the previous well, one. It's kind of the other way around. I did Cold War Warm Hearts last year. And that, when I left college, I went off behind the Iron Curtain for over a year and traveled then. That was very, very um, extraordinary and different from anything else. I did that, wrote that book last year. But this year I did the one that precedes it. It was when we were students sort of getting to, to learn how to do this kind of thing. So that's book number two. You know what the next question is, don't you? Is this a trilogy? Are you going to do the had, you know, got married, had kids back on the road again? Um, no. Oh. The first first one was my childhood and hey, the second one chronologically is this one when I learned as a student. And the third one, which I did last year, sorry to be confusing, is Cold War Warm Heart. Oh, okay. I've finished my trilogy now. You know, I've I've done it. I've taken it up to um, young adulthood and when I got married, this lovely man who I'm still with. So that's that on that. If you have to, that's that's on that, okay. So if you have to pick a a moment, is it, is it sort of being proposed to on in the back of a truck in the Atlas Mountains? Is it is it seeing the sort of the, the beauty of, of of you know with the baguette and the fromage in France or the, just the great fun of Ireland? What would you say? What would you say? Give me three of it, your highlights. Okay, that's a hard question, mind. Um, in Spain, I was with Mary, who I've mentioned, and another girl called Chris, and we were hiking along. This is after the horrible experience in the middle of the night. We're hiking along. 
and we saw this little village on the plain, somewhere near Cordoba, and we said to the driver, stop, stop, we want to get out here, because we wanted to get into country life, we want to learn about animals and farming and meet country people, so we got out and went to this village, I can't even remember the name of it, but there it was, and we made friends with a young woman called Maria, and we got to know the family and we they showed us their animals and the men were coming back from working in the fields. The hedges were made of cactus, which was extraordinary for us, used to hawthorn hedges. So anyway, everyone was very friendly. And then at lunchtime, we were invited in to eat and we sat around the table, it's such a privilege, and we sat with them all. And there was a big round pot of beans in a sort of sauce on the middle of the table. Right. And everybody had a spoon, and we all ate with our spoon from this bowl. And, you know, that was so touching and so homely and such a privilege to share a meal like that with his family. That was, I would say, one of the high points. Do you think of another two? Off- oh, should, we, should we just end on that high, high point? End of, on that high point. I am yeah, that high point. Yeah. The, yeah. Book, the book is called Hit the Road, Gals. It's by Bridget Ashton, who has been to today. Bridget, do you, do you have a website? Do you do social media at all? Can people find you online? They can go to my website, www.bridgetgubbins.co.uk, because I did the three um, autobiographies in my pre-marriage name, Ashton, but it's actually Gubbins, G-U-B-B-I-N-S. You can find me that way. And you can also order the book via our own yes. virtual bookstore as well. The book is called Hit the Road, Girls. It's by Bridget Ashton slash Gubbins. Uh, Bridget, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you this morning. Well, thank you very much. Bye.